Drie minutes, nummer 1556, met een uitzending van vandaag 23 februari 2019. Dit is het bulletin van zaterdag. Vandaag bleek de gelikte TX-factor versie van het RCB-nieuws nog niet beschikbaar te zijn. Daar hebben we vandaag het ERRL Audio News, het ERRL Audio News, plus de column van Onno. Als datum hebben we ook de column van Onno, maar dan in tekstvorm in de supersolide modus MFSK64. En van die schakelt automatisch, dus daar hoef je als je dat inschakelt niks aan te doen. Vervolgens is er een kleine afbeelding, ook in FLDGM en MFSK 128. Die schakelt ook weer automatisch. Nadat de afbeelding is verstuurd, volgt er een klein stukje veldhel. Met daarna een stukje in de chatmodus FSQ6. Die laatste schakelt niet automatisch. FSQ6 is de bovenste optie als je FLDG gebruikt. Er zijn echter ook andere Het zou kunnen dat het bij de Nederlandse versie anders is trouwens. Er zijn echter ook andere manieren om FSQ te bedrijven. Alle data is 15. Hertz. De data is helemaal aan het eind, maar daarvoor is er nog een bijzonder verhaal dat 35 minuten duurt, ook in het Engels van de hackerspodcast Malicious Life van Ren Levy. Ren Levy. Hij beschrijft in een zeer uitgebreid verhaal over onder andere Guglielmo Marconi en Nikola Tesla en hoe in die tijd de eerste man in the middle attack in zijn werk ging. This is ARRL Audio News, your weekly summary of news highlights from the world of amateur radio. If you retransmit audio news through a repeater, listen for the Morse code K character, followed by four seconds of silence. That's your cue to stop transmitting so that your repeater timer can reset. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, and these are our stories for Friday, February 22nd. A new ARIES plan was adopted by the ARRL Board of Directors at its annual meeting in January. The Board's Public Service Enhancement Working Group, or PSEWG, spent more than three years crafting the ARIES plan, which, ARRL officials believe, provides a much-needed update of the program's role in public service and emergency preparedness in the 21st century. Concerns focused on bringing ARIES into alignment with the National Incident Management System and Incident Command System and creating more consistent and standardized ARIES training requirements. With input from ARIES members and a peer review team, and the assistance of emergency response officials with some partner organizations, the working group came up with a plan that provides guidelines to ensure that ARIES remains a service of organized, trained, qualified, and credentialed amateur radio volunteers who can provide public service partners with radio communication expertise, capability, and capacity. Based on input from ARIES participants, the training requirements in the final ARIES plan consist of the free FEMA Professional Development Series. The series comprises these independent study, or IS, courses, as well as the ARRL's EC-001 and EC-016 emergency communication courses. As part of adopting the ARIES plan, the ARRL board approved a proposal to make the ARRL EC courses free for ARIES members. The ARIES plan outlines a three-tiered membership structure based on increased responsibility levels and accompanying training requirements. Although the tiers are not a required path, they serve to define three distinct ways to participate in the ARIES program. It's up to the participant to determine his or her level of involvement. In recognizing the local and regional nature of emergency communications needs in disaster response activations, the plan notes that training requirements are ultimately the responsibility of the section manager, with each manager approving training for local ARIES teams as local conditions and needs dictate. The ARIES plan also highlights the relationship between ARIES and the national traffic system. The ARIES plan stresses that ARIES participants are not first responders, and it encourages ARIES leaders to develop and grow their group's partnerships with state emergency management agencies and officials. The FCC is reminding electronic device retailers that Suppliers Declaration of Conformity Procedures, abbreviated SDOC, are now in effect and being enforced. In an FCC enforcement advisory released February 15th, the FCC Enforcement Bureau pointed out that marketers of RF devices may be subject to new compliance requirements provided in the SDOC procedures. This would potentially impact some amateur radio equipment. Two separate procedures are in place to address equipment authorization of RF devices, SDOC and certification. 
In July 2017, the FCC amended some rules regarding the authorization of RF equipment, and those changes became effective in November of that year, with a one-year transition period to phase out two equipment authorization procedures, verification and declaration of conformity, and replace them with SDOC. The transition period ended on November 2, 2018. According to the FCC Office of Engineering and Technology, the list of devices subject to SDOC covers, quote, equipment that does not contain a radio transmitter and contains only digital circuitry, such as computer peripherals, microwave ovens, industrial scientific medical equipment, switching power supplies, LED light bulbs, radio receivers, and TV interface devices. The FCC said for equipment that contains both unintentional radiators and intentional radiators, the unintentional radiator portion generally may be authorized under either SDOC or certification, while intentional radiators, such as radio transmitters, are typically required to be certified. In a separate enforcement advisory released on February 15th, the FCC cautioned LED sign marketers to comply with FCC rules, noting that the EB has, quote, observed a growing number of companies, unquote, marketing noncompliant LED signs. In general, LED sign panels are subject to SDOC procedures. Russia is going to disconnect from the Internet, but it is only for a brief test. Authorities and major Internet providers in Russia intend to disconnect the country from the Internet as part of a planned experiment purportedly aimed at enhancing national security. The stated reason for the experiment is to gather insights and provide feedback and modifications to a proposed law introduced in the Russian parliament in December. A draft of the law mandates that Russian Internet providers ensure the independence of the Russian Internet, or RUNET, and to disconnect the country from the rest of the Internet in the event of foreign aggression. Russian telecom firms would be required to install technical means to reroute all Russian Internet traffic to exchange points that have been approved, which would ensure that traffic between Russian users stays within Russia and is not rerouted to servers abroad where it could be intercepted. Eric Anderson, K9EU of Naperville, Illinois, has assumed the role of manager for the 9th District Incoming QSL Bureau. He is a longtime volunteer with the Bureau, as well as a noted and accomplished DXer and contester. He succeeds John Mayers, K9QVB, who served as manager for two decades and will remain a sorter and letter dispatcher. The 9th District Bureau handles more than 45,000 DX QSL cards each month for U.S. amateurs in the continental U.S. who have nines in their call signs, regardless of where they live. The new Bureau address is NIDXA, P.O. Box 125, Naperville, Illinois, 60566. 76-year-old yachtswoman Jean Socrates, VE0JS slash KC2IOV, passed the southern tip of Africa, some 300 miles to the north, on Valentine's Day as she forged on toward Australia and New Zealand in her 38-foot sailing vessel, Nareda. While underway, Socrates keeps in touch with a community of friends via amateur radio, and she's sticking to a schedule of 7.160 MHz at 0230 UTC daily. Socrates reported making contact with ham radio friends on the U.S. West Coast on February 17th. She's been blogging her progress. The retired math teacher and United Kingdom native also is no stranger to circumnavigating the globe, having already become the oldest woman to complete a solo, nonstop, unassisted, round-the-world voyage. Ham radio served as her link to terra firma during her earlier adventures. Since 2013, she's made two additional attempts to become the oldest person to circumnavigate the Earth, the goal she's now attempting to achieve. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. If you are a trusted QSL user, be sure you update the database. The ARRL has added JO97, FO99, and QO100 to the list of valid satellites. If you're using a logging program, you will have to perform the update in order to transmit any contacts on these satellites to LOTW. We have another new distance record, this time Gustavo, PR8KW, in GI77, and Jose, EB1AO, in IN52, set a record on AO91 of 6,100. 
33 kilometers. Congratulations to both of them. Are you new to satellites or a seasoned veteran at them? In either case, there might be something of interest on the AMSAT.org website under Station and Operating Hints. The URL is AMSAT.org slash station hyphen and hyphen operating hyphen hints. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO, for the ARRL Audio News. This is the ARRL Audio News propagation forecast for Friday, February 22nd. The sun may be spotless, but that doesn't mean it stopped blasting solar winds our way. Expect some minor geomagnetic disturbances on the HF bands over the next several days, but really nothing serious. The solar flux index remains at 70, which is somewhat good news for DX conditions on 40, 30, and 20 meters. This weekend is the North American RTTY QSO party, and those keyboard contesters will likely find their best conditions on 40 and 20 meters. On VHF and UHF, the hot spots at the moment are in the deep south from Louisiana east to Georgia. In fact, parts of southern Florida may see some pretty strong band openings on 2 meters and up. And that concludes ARRL Audio News for this week. Our thanks to all contributors to this week's report. ARRL Audio News is produced by the American Radio Relay League, the National Association for Amateur Radio. For more information on amateur radio or the ARRL, visit us on the web at ARRL.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter by searching for ARRL. If you have a question or comment about ARRL Audio News, email us at Audio News at ARRL.org. This program is copyright ARRL, all rights reserved. 73, and thanks for listening. Foundations of Amateur Radio. Previously, I've spoken about the joy of making something out of not much. On that theme, I've covered Whisper, the weak signal propagation reporter, a mechanism to use a modest station to report signals received which is something any suitably interested person can participate in. No license required. For a time I had my radio, a Yaesu FT-857D, connected to a Windows XP notebook running WSJTX, a piece of software that has the ability to set the frequency of your radio and then listen to what the radio is hearing, attempt to decode it and then report on what was heard. The beauty of this system is that you're using your own station to report signals heard, that is, your own antenna, your own coax, your own radio. Essentially, you can use it to see what can be heard from around the world at your station. I had this running for a while, but the setup was less than satisfactory because I used the same radio and antenna to run weekly nets. The computer was running Windows XP and running out of disk space since WSJTX has the option to save all the audio heard, which was clogging up my drive. It also meant that I was required to remember that I needed to reset the volume of the radio, set the squelch just so, disconnect and more importantly reconnect the antenna when there were storms about, and a few other annoyances that became just a little too much for it to be fun. After doing this for a couple of months, I just gave up and put it in the too hard basket. The other day, I started afresh. I started with a Raspberry Pi. It's a single board computer about the size of a credit card that comes in at about 30 bucks, is powered off a USB adapter and runs Linux. Since I've been using Linux for around 20 years now, it seemed like a natural fit. I managed to obtain an RTL SDR dongle, which, if you're not familiar, is essentially a USB device that you can use to listen to RF frequencies. Without going too deep, these gadgets started life as USB DVB-T and FM receivers. You know, the USB dongles that you can plug into your computer to watch free-to-air TV or listen to FM radio. Back in March of 2010, Eric Fry got curious about figuring out if he could make a Linux version for one of the dongles work by reverse engineering the communication between the dongle and the supplied Windows software. In 2012, Antti Pelosary built on that and published his findings on the Linux media mailing list. Things exploded from there. So, an RTL SDR dongle connected to a Raspberry Pi running Linux. 
At this point, it would be great if I could report success and show and tell everything I've learned. But then, for that to happen, I would need to actually have had success, and I'm not quite there yet. I managed to decode one, count them, one whisper packet on six meters once. Of course, I couldn't help myself and started to improve things, and since then, I've not heard anything. I can tell you that there is plenty of documentation online about the subject, and I'll be adding my version of that once I've got mine up and running. There's a few things to work on. For example, listening on six meters is all fine and well, as long as there are six meter stations within hearing that are on and transmitting. Turns out that the station that I heard once last weekend has been switched off for a week. I've just changed bands to see if that improves things, but only time will tell. I've also been using a mechanism to change bands automatically every 15 minutes. But without any spots, I'm not sure if my setup is working or not, and I've just been unlucky not to hear anything. The challenges continue, but then I suppose that's why I'm here in the first place. I will add that a problem shared is a problem halved. I mentioned my challenge to a local amateur who sprang into action and set up a whisper beacon, just so I can test against it. I'll let you know how I go. Or you can monitor for my spots on the Whisper website and celebrate when you see a spot with my call sign on it. Because I will be. Celebrating, that is. As an aside, it continues to surprise me that this hobby has its fingers in so many different pies, and my chosen profession of IT geek is just another aspect of amateur radio. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. In 1903, Guglielmo Marconi, an electrical engineer and the man often credited with having invented radio, set out to demonstrate a new theory of his to the world. That tuned to the same frequency, he could send the signal from one radio transmitter to another over any distance. Not only that, but the signal would be completely private, no interference fully secure. A celebrity in the field, Marconi was confident in his discovery. So he arranged for a show to be held in an historic London theatre before the British aristocracy and the national press. And everything would have gone to plan, too, if not for one of Marconi's longtime rivals. A man whose actions that day, you might say, made him the first grey hat hacker ever. Hi, I'm Ryan Levy. Welcome back to Malicious Life in collaboration with Cyberism. In today's episode, Guglielmo Marconi, the beloved, hated, disputed inventor of radio, gets trolled by a mustached magician in the world's first ever wireless man in the middle attack. Nearly a decade before his 1903 London showcase, Guglielmo Marconi demonstrated his first proof of concept before an audience of his mother. In his late teenage years, he'd become interested in reading about and tinkering with radio transmission in the attic of his home in Veneto, Italy. It didn't take him long to evolve from an enthusiast to a bona fide inventor. Late at night in December of 1894, he placed a button, a transmitter, on a bench in his home and a bell, a receiver, on the other side of the room. Using radio waves, he was able to make the bell ring simply by pressing the button. What would now seem mundane was anything but at the time, and within a year, Marconi's radio signals could travel half a mile. In 1896, two miles. The rapid improvement convinced him that he was only just scratching the surface of what was possible. Still, the opportunities for funding were limited in his home country. Being born to a family of wealth and high class, he used a powerful family friend to make introduction with the Italian ambassador to the UK. The Italian ambassador agreed that England offered more opportunity for funding than Italy could, but added one condition that the young inventor should take care not to reveal his discoveries before receiving a patent for them. 
It would appear that the young Marconi took this advice to heart. Patents will become an important part of his story to come. In 1896, Guglielmo Marconi traveled to London to make a name for himself as an inventor. What he didn't know at the time was that his future success would be inextricably linked with an event that had already passed across the Atlantic Ocean. In the 1890s, Nikola Tesla was at the forefront of wireless energy transmission technology. As early as 1891, he'd been demonstrating a radical new mechanism commonly referred to as the Tesla coil, a mechanism capable of transmitting and receiving radio signals when two coils are tuned to accommodate the same frequency. At his pace and with his genius, Tesla was right on the verge of inventing a workable technology able to transmit information across great distances. He, in short, was in the midst of inventing radio. In 1895, Tesla was preparing to a public demonstration. He was going to send a signal all the way from Manhattan to West Point, New York, a distance of over 50 miles. And then, in the lead-up to the event, all of his work came to a screeching halt. Today, 3335 West Broadway can be found in a neighborhood populated by the tall office buildings of Manhattan's financial district. 3335, if you look at it, is rather nondescript, just as boring and colorless as the office building you're picturing in your head right now. Almost a century and a half ago, however, it housed a laboratory owned by Nikola Tesla. The lab took up its entire fourth floor and acted as a hub for some of the most forward scientific breakthroughs of the late 19th century. That was until March 13, 1895, when a fire that started in the building's basement spread and ultimately engulfed the entire building in flames. The product of years of hard work from the world's foremost inventor of his time was now gone. Advancements in the fields of energy and communications were thrown off course. I am in too much grief to talk, Tesla told the New York Times. What can I say? Perhaps for the first time ever, Nikola Tesla had nothing to say. Tesla would move his operation northeast to Greenwich Village in the months following the fire. But the time and effort it would take to reconstruct his previous progress in the field of radio transmission would put him back a year, just enough of a window to allow another young inventor in the field to step in and take his place. It's not possible to claim definitively that Marconi wouldn't have made it if not for Tesla's unfortunate accident. Marconi was, either way, a remarkable inventor. However, the fact is, by 1896, a whole year after Tesla was ready to send the signal over 50 miles, Marconi's best effort could barely traverse a fraction of that distance. His early mechanism was mocked, with some claiming it wouldn't transmit a signal across a pond. Still, he filed patent for the technology that same year. Marconi did have the excuse of still being, you know, 21 years old at the time. It wouldn't take him more than a year later to improve his work, and on May 13th, 1897, the two-year, two-month anniversary of Tesla's lab fire, Marconi successfully sent a signal across the English Channel. His trick? Implementing an oscillator invented four years prior by Nikola Tesla. Leveraging his breakthrough technology, in 1897, the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company was established. And its owner? He was not yet content by simply hopping ponds. In 1899, two years after traversing the Bristol Channel, Marconi set his sights on a new goal, sending a signal across the entire Atlantic Ocean. A signal so great, you might say, that it could reach Nikola Tesla at his doorstep. In order to build such a device, Marconi knew he'd have to step up his game, ditching the 200 to 400 watt transmitters he'd been using thus far 
in favor of a more powerful contraption. No transmitter so powerful existed at the time, so he enlisted help from another inventor, John Ambrose Fleming. Fleming was an already established physicist and electrical engineer and consultant for Marconi Wireless, who'd spent the following two years developing a large, complex radio transmitter up to the task. Marconi Company wasn't so much to scoof at in 1899, but it became a lot to scoof at within only a year. You'd think it had something to do with his demonstration at the Bristol Channel, but more likely his company was buoyed up by Marconi's personal connections with England's aristocracy, the kind of connections that allowed him to come from England in the first place and later landed him fancy contracts within the highest orders of English business and government. He was now lecturing, for example, at the Royal Institution in London. In December 1898, the British Lightship Service authorized wireless communication between two Southeast England lighthouses separated by 12 miles using Marconi Company Tech. Three months later, one of the lighthouses sent out a signal to the other in response to a merchant ship crashing along their shared shoreline. A lifeboat was promptly deployed, all thanks to Marconi's radio signaling. In all, Marconi's stock in England jumped from $3 to $22 per share. Keep in mind, $22 back then were a lot more than $22 today. Guglielmo Marconi was now an internationally famous inventor and businessman, still only in his mid-twenties. The Scottish-American tycoon Andrew Carnegie invested in the company, Thomas Edison invested and signed on to the effort as a consulting engineer. All this while the company was in development for its most ambitious ocean-crossing project. Fleming's work for Marconi came to a T the following year, and on December 12, 1901, Marconi Company announced a successful radio transmission from England to Newfoundland, 2,200 miles in total across the ocean. The claim was heavily disputed by experts of the time. It's possible that Marconi exaggerated his results. It would take him one more year and five more days to publicly demonstrably prove that he could transmit a signal from Canada to Great Britain. However, he ultimately got there, though Marconi had all along won the battle for international publicity, became highly, widely acclaimed. On January 18, 1903, for example, President Theodore Roosevelt successfully sent a message of greetings to King Edward VII in the UK from a Marconi Company station in Massachusetts. Where the public was concerned, justified or not, he had now fully eclipsed Nikola Tesla as the world's heralded leader in radio communication. Between their rapid rise in the market and their new technology supporting intercontinental communication, Marconi Wireless posed a severe threat to existing wired telegraph companies of the Western Hemisphere. So naturally, leaders in the industry sought any way to stop the rapid change that threatened to upend the market. It was 1903 when a manager of the Atlantic Telegraph Company came up with a perfectly mischievous plan capitalizing on Marconi's insatiable ambitiousness. As demonstrated by his questionable 1901 announcement of a successful transatlantic signal transmission, Guglielmo Marconi was the kind of person who made claims even before fully substantiating them. In a February 1903 interview with the St. James Gazette, a London-based newspaper, Marconi made yet another grand claim. He said, quote, I can tune my instruments so that no other instrument that is not similarly tuned can tap my messages, End quote. In other words, Marconi claimed that by keeping the specific tuning of his instrument secret, he could create an unhackable communications system. It was the kind of invention that could attract the attention of governments, militaries, high-end businesses, and the thing to launch Marconi Company even further ahead of the competition. 
how could Marconi voice such an audacious claim? To answer this question, we need to dive a bit deeper into the basics of radio technology. The way radio transmission system worked in Marconi's days was by emitting radio waves in a very broad range of frequencies. Take as an example a radio station such as WNYC broadcasting from New York City. If I wished to listen to WNYC today, I would tune my car's radio receiver to a specific frequency, 93.9 MHz in WNYC's case. Had WNYC existed in Marconi's time, it would have transmitted its radio signal in a much, much, much broader range of frequencies, perhaps all the way from 1 kHz up to 300 MHz. This broad transmission range was initially useful for Marconi, since it enabled him to use simple receivers on the other side of the communication channel. Yet, as Marconi strived to bridge longer and longer distances with his radio systems, it also created a problem. You see, sending a radio broadcast across the English Channel, a distance of a few tens of miles, requires relatively little energy. But crossing the Atlantic Ocean is a completely different thing. With his existing broad-frequency radio systems, Marconi needed to increase the energy output of his transmitters a hundredfold at the very least. This meant larger batteries, larger antennas, larger coils, larger everything, basically. It might be feasible to build such transmitters on land, but not so feasible on ships, which were the main focus of Marconi's business efforts. A natural solution to this problem is to focus all the energy emitted by the transmitter into a narrow band of frequencies, thereby enabling the radio waves to travel longer distances before losing their strength. A good analogy would be replacing a short-range shotgun which spreads many bullets over a wide area with a sniper rifle which fires a single bullet to a much larger distance. The novel technology that enabled this narrow band transmission was called syntonic transmission, and it was being developed in parallel by several physicists and inventors in Europe and the US. In its core, syntonic transmission meant that both the transmitter and receiver in a given channel were both tuned to the same frequency. That is, the transmitter would send radio waves in a specific frequency, and the receiver would be blind to all radio frequencies except that specific frequency. This both focused the transmission energy and made the receiver much more sensitive, felling two birds with one stone. Initially, Marconi ignored syntonic transmission, but when he understood its usefulness, he explored it in depth and patented his own version of it. It then occurred to him that in addition to increasing range, syntonic transmission can also make eavesdropping on a communication much more difficult. If I'm transmitting on a specific frequency and you're listening on that specific frequency, someone listening on some other frequency would get nothing but static. Think about it for just a moment and you'll notice a glaring problem with that logic. That any other receiver also tuned to that same frequency will be able to tap into the same line of communication. This means that for the conversation to be truly private, the signal frequency would have to be kept secret. In modern terms, we would refer to this as security by obscurity. A legitimate policy when used in tandem with other more robust cybersecurity techniques, but not one you'd want to bet all your company's sensitive assets on. This glaring problem was almost immediately spotted by several of Marconi's critics, one of whom was Neville Maskelyne. Maskelyne was a 39-year-old with a kind of mustache that made him look 59. His persona is a kind of marriage, part intellectual, part troll. Innovative and funny don't often go together, but Neville's father did it even before him, as the inventor of the strange and hilarious coin-activated spend-a-penny lock for public toilets. Masculine was a manager of a telecommunications company, but also an accomplished magician. 
So Maskelyne had a deep technical background in exactly the field Marconi was operating in, but even more importantly, he knew how to snuff out a trick. Maskelyne wasn't only well prepared, however, he was also a long-standing rival of Marconi. As a manager at Atlantic Telegraph, he'd been mired in battles with the inventor over multiple patent applications in the UK. He himself was an experimenter in the arts of wireless communication, having successfully sent a signal over a 10-mile distance. He was only a step or two behind Marconi as Marconi's career skyrocketed. But being that step or two step behind would become increasingly frustrating as his rival snatched up patents just before he could. Based on what we know today, you probably wouldn't categorize Neville Maskelyne as an outwardly vengeful person. On the contrary, he was quite playful for a man of his intellect. Still, he had plenty motivation to challenge Marconi when the opportunity presented itself. Malicious Life is sponsored by Cyber Reason, a cybersecurity company. If you're into cybersecurity, and since you're listening to our show, there's a good chance you are, I don't think I need to tell you about the problem of logs. We've all had that experience. Something's off in the network. Perhaps something malicious is going on. So you grab the logs and start browsing around for signs of foul play. But even a one megabyte log file is roughly 500 pages of text or a good-sized book. It's the classic needle in the haystack problem. What you need is a system that can not only detect threats in the network, but also screen false positives and show you the important stuff. In other words, what you need is a system that gives you a story. Jeffrey Wright, a cybersecurity manager at RTI Surgical, knows exactly what I'm talking about. I'm Jeff Wright. I'm an RTI Surgical. We are a medical device company. We actually manufacture medical devices. I am the primary person responsible for security at RTI. I've been in the game since the 90s, since dial-up modems. It's great to be technical and it's to be, great to be log-driven, but when you start trying to talk to someone that doesn't understand security at all, all they really want is a story. They, you know, It's all about visual aids. But we didn't have anything that really was piping on the whole concept of ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. And I felt that CyberReason did that for me. It added a layer of security that we just didn't have. It added that visibility to the endpoints when they're not in the office, which was a big deal for me. I was very impressed with not only the product, but the biggest thing for me was, as someone who likes the red team, I was like, who better to protect the environment? Someone actually has a history of attacking. Now we have that visibility into the endpoints. So not only do we know that, oh, I have a problem, but now, CyberReason allows us to see the how, the why, and the when. CyberReason's deep hunting engine gives you deep visibility into endpoints. It automatically extracts statistical and behavioral analytics at a rate of 8 million queries per second on the data collected. CyberReason's technology can surface malicious operations without you writing a single rule. No more alert fatigue, no more huge log files. Learn more at CyberReason.com. As Guglielmo Marconi and John Fleming traversed England, touting their perfectly secure communications technology, Maskelyne took a skeptic's view. On March 25, 1903, he commented on those claims to London's Daily Telegraph newspaper with what could only be described as dripping sarcasm. Quote, if Professor Fleming's statements can be justified in practice, it is clear that no other worker in wireless can ever compete with Mr. Marconi, he said. We others must all write off our time, labor, and money as dead loss. But before allowing ourselves to be snuffed out, we, whose modest achievements are obscured by the glamour of Mr. Marconi's greatness, have a right to demand the absolute justification of his claims. End quote. However noble he claimed to be, Neville Maskelyne was not operating alone, spontaneously, nor entirely out of a sense of justice. 
the Eastern Telegraph Company, operated the British Empire's primary international communications network out of Cornwell, the very county where Marconi had set up his transatlantic power station. According to New Scientist magazine, Eastern Telegraph hired Neville Maskelin to spy on Marconi Wireless after their December 1901 announcement of a transatlantic comm system. On November 7, 1902, he bragged to a reporter that, quote, I received Marconi messages with a 25-feet collecting circuit raised on a scaffold pole. No wonder I was interested. When eventually the mast was erected and a full-sized collecting circuit installed, the problem presented was not how to intercept the messages, but how to deal with the enormous excess of energy. That, of course, involved no difficulty, and by relaying my receiving instruments through landlines to the station in the valley below, I had all the signals brought home to me at any hour of the night or day. End quote. As proof, Maskelin published the messages he had received, thus refuting Marconi's claims of having a fully secure wireless transmission channel. At first, Marconi claimed that these messages were forged, but later admitted that syntonic transmission can be tapped. Still, said Marconi, it would take an expert to design a system that could be tuned to a specific frequency, and the same expert could reasonably design a system to eavesdrop on telegraphy communication. So, at the very least, both technologies are similarly secure. Marconi was right. Back then, designing syntonic transmission did require significant expertise, and only a handful of people in the whole world had that knowledge. After backing up on his security claims, Marconi started emphasizing another advantage that syntonic transmission had over the existing wireless technology, its immunity to interference. Interference was, and still is, a big problem for wireless communication. If two radio stations are broadcasting on the same frequency, the two broadcasts would interfere with one another like two speakers emitting two different songs at the same time. Interference was even a bigger problem with the existing wide-frequency range radio technology since each transmitter was essentially blocking a huge part of the available frequency spectrum. With syntonic transmission, both sides were tuned to the same specific narrow band frequency, and so would not interfere with other conversations taking place on other frequencies. This would be like having one speaker playing a song in a frequency range suitable for humans, and the other speaker playing a different song in a higher frequency range that only dogs can hear. Marconi claimed that his new radio technology was interference-proof. That is, it would not interfere with other transmissions, nor, and this is the crucial part of our story, would it be susceptible to interference from other transmitters working on some other frequency range. Again, this claim was met with skepticism by critics who doubted that Marconi's system were so finely tuned as to block any interference whatsoever. But to the general public, Marconi was a wizard inventor who was probably able to build any kind of possible communications device imaginable. Few would have been brash enough to question the claims of a man who brought long-distance radio to the world, especially during the prime of his career. Guglielmo Marconi and John Fleming arranged for a public demonstration of their communications mechanism to be held at the Royal Institute in London on June 4, 1903. In an account published two weeks following the event in The Electrician magazine, Neville Maskelin explained what he was thinking about in the days leading up to the showcase. Quote, Personally, I met with no opportunity of instituting practical tests until the announcement of Professor Fleming's lectures at the Royal Institution upon the subject of electric resonance and wireless telegraphy. Even then, I did not realize the inwardness of the situation. My only idea was that I should like to hear the lectures. 
When, however, it was pointed out to me that the practical demonstrations accompanying the lectures rendered independent tests possible, I at once grasped the fact that the opportunity was too good to be missed. Accordingly, arrangements were made for carrying out a simple experimental test. Surely enough, as Marconi and Fleming were making arrangements to demonstrate the capabilities of their new technology, Maskelin was secretly making arrangements to demonstrate its limitations. To do this was something more than a right, he wrote. It was a duty. Those who might and should have produced tangible proofs either could not or would not do so. Therefore, it must be done by others. Masculine was, in this regard, a true gray hat hacker. On the day of the event, Marconi was at his company's Cornwall, England power station. It was 5 p.m. when John Fleming began his lecture on stage at the Royal Institution Theatre in front of a crowd filled with many of London's highest intellectuals and aristocrats. Neville Maskelyne was just nearby at his father's West End Music Hall with a radio transmitter. Marconi's transmitter and Fleming's receiver were pre-tuned to the same frequency as Fleming delivered his lecture about their company's patented interference-proof communication system to the crowd. Maskelyne's transmitter was tuned to a different, lower frequency. Just before 6 p.m., as Fleming was winding down his speech, it could have been a rickety overhead fan or maybe someone with the jitters, so few paid attention. John Fleming was partially deaf, so he didn't hear it. Fleming's assistant was the only one in the theater who knew what was going on with this quiet little patter. In magic, patter is the term used to describe a magician's script, the oral component of their demonstration. Because magic is part trickery, part showmanship, the performer's patter is crucial to engaging audiences. In his book on magic, Neville Maskelyne writes that, quote, artistic presentation demands the employment of patter as an inevitable necessity, end quote. At the Royal Institute that day, the patter of Neville Maskelyne's grand trick was literally a patter, Morse code being transmitted without warning to Fleming's receiver. Here's the thing, though. For this trick, the audience wasn't necessarily the crowd at the Royal Institute. It was Fleming himself. When Maskelyne was plotting his scheme, he realized something. Quote, the difficulty which struck me, however, was this, he wrote. While observers at the lecture would easily discover that the interferences were not successful, on the other hand, successful interference might be readily concealed by those in charge of the receiving instruments. The only hope, then, was to interpolate messages calculated to anger and draw somebody at the receiving end. End quote. Remember in 1901, when Guglielmo Marconi announced he'd send a radio signal across the Atlantic Ocean? Neville Maskelin remembered the event well. He knew his rival's history of telling the public one thing while keeping the actual results of his experiments confined to his eyes alone. He knew well enough that, should he hack their signal, John Fleming may well obscure the sound, write it off as nothing, or label it all part of the show to an audience without the tools to know better. It's necessary to understand all these moving parts of the story to explain why, when Maskelyne's signal did begin to go through, it simply read, rats, 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 over and over again. He was trying to get a rise out of John Fleming, so he had some fun. Taking aim at Marconi, he patched through a limerick he made up. It read, quote, There was a young fellow of Italy who diddled the public quite prettily, end quote. Here's an account of the event as told by one of Fleming's assistants at the lecture. Quote, I plainly heard the astounding word rats spelled out in Morse, and when this irrelevant word was repeated, suspicion gave place to fear. 
Evidently, something has gone wrong. Was it a practical joke or was it even scientific sabotage? The hands of the clock, with equal detachment, also moved on, while I, with a furiously divided attention, glanced around the audience to see if anybody else had noticed these astonishing messages. All seemed well, a testimony to the spell of Fleming's lecture, until my harassed eye encountered the face of supernatural innocence, and then the mystery was solved. The face was that of a man, Dr. Horace Manders, who I knew to be associated with Mr. Neville Meskelin in some of his scientific work. I tore off the tape with this preposterous dots and dashes, rolled it up, and with the pretense of throwing it away, I put it in my pocket." End quote. Fleming, it turns out, didn't notice anything. He was partially deaf and so calmly lectured on. Masculine stopped what he was doing just moments before Marconi's signals came in, and the scheduled demonstration began. Of course, by then, the real demonstration of the night was already over. Word got out, and the day after the show, a PR battle began. Marconi and Fleming claimed that the attack was snuffed out once the receiver was correctly tuned, that the interference was actually caused not by radio transmission, but by currents running through the ground, and even that there was no interference at all, since Marconi's signal did ultimately come through. Fleming, in more than one contribution to the Times of London, labeled the act scientific hooliganism, which presumably at the time was a sick burn. Masculine admitted to being the hacker only a few days later, beginning a claim-for-claim claim war with Fleming in the Times of London. It ended when he wrote the following passage, quote, Thus, within less than a week, we have been led to the following harmonious conclusions. One, the interference was successful because my signals were read and objected to. Two, it was not successful because my signals were cut out by tuning. Three, it was partially successful because the installation was but temporary. Four, it was only successful while the receiver was being tuned. And five, it must have been entirely successful because the receiver was not tuned at all. And then some people pretend to wonder at our wanting to make independent investigations. Well, qui volt de sipi de sipatur, end quote. Those four final words translate to, let he be deceived who wishes to be deceived. The 1903 Marconi hack feels, in more ways than one, still relevant today. The evil corporation, the mischievous hacker. And just like today, no proper news outlet better captured the essence of the story than Punch, a satirical magazine who ridiculed Marconi's claims of having an interference-proof technology. In an editorial note to the Daily Wireless, a paper giving the latest news on transatlantic travel by means of Marconigrams, the author writes that, quote, owing to the large number of messages transmitted simultaneously today, the publication of this journal has been a task of some difficulty. Apparently, many of the messages are private greetings to passengers from their friends on shore. Since we cannot disentangle them from the news items intended for the daily wireless, we are compelled to print the Marconigrams as received. London, April 1st. The share market is quiet as a whole, but there is a slight depression in your new woolen vests which are in the black Pullman too, and do be careful to see that there is no truth in the reported Armenian massacre. Lords urge that you are such a duck and must be vaccinated on Tuesday. Sacramuch. Oh, my darling pussy whoopsie, your own teeny wants you because second grade goods are in brisk demand. End quote. Neville Maskelin wouldn't achieve anything so great as his wireless hack again in life, but his actions did have a major impact on the future of wireless technology. 
the masculine affair showed that radio communication is in fact vulnerable to eavesdropping and accidental or purposeful interference even if the transmitter and receiver are tuned to a specific frequency. This fact encouraged researchers to take wireless communication security more seriously, with many encryption and electronic warfare techniques emerging in the following decades. And it also drove governments to enforce better monitoring and control of the radio spectrum by allocation of broadcast licenses for specific radio frequencies. John Fleming when signing on to build that tower which sent a signal across the Atlantic Ocean, was promised 500 shares of the company stock upon successful completion of the project, but was forced to agree that, quote, if we get across the Atlantic, the main credit will be and must forever be Mr. Marconi's, end quote. Once the tower was completed, the price of Marconi's stock had risen from $3 to $22. Marconi reneged on the agreement to hand over 500 company shares to Fleming and claimed his partner's work was limited to some help with a power plant. Nikola Tesla spent years brewed in a battle with Marconi over American patents. Tesla's claim as the inventor of fundamental radio technology was approved in 1897 and Marconi's attempt at the same patent failed. However, once his company skyrocketed in value and received the backing of prominent figures in business and government, the U.S. Patent Office reversed their earlier decision, granting Marconi Tesla's patent in 1904. When Marconi won a Nobel Prize for his work in radio, Tesla realized the man who copied his work had now stolen his glory. He filed suit against Marconi Wireless on the basis of infringement, but lacked the money to go to court with a major multinational corporation. Only in 1943, following Tesla's death, did the US Supreme Court reinstate his original patent and claim as the inventor of radio. If this sounds poetic, well, according to an account published by PBS, there were ulterior motives. Marconi's company was suing the U.S. government for use of its patent technology in building their military weaponry. So the reversal was committed mostly out of convenience. Guglielmo Marconi's reputation today is generally mixed. The hit he took in 1903 didn't last long, as evidenced by his Nobel Prize. His reputation grew even larger in 1912 when employees of his marine communication company aboard the Titanic used their radios to tirelessly phone nearby ships that helped save some of the sinking passengers. The UK's postmaster general said later that, quote, those who have been saved have been saved through one man, Mr. Marconi and his marvelous invention. In his later years, Marconi would go on to become a prominent member of Italy's fascist party during World War II, appointed in 1930 to the Fascist Grand Council by none other than Benito Mussolini himself. In his book, Neville Maskelyne writes that, quote, to produce a magical effect of original conception is a work of high art, end quote. What he achieved on that summer evening in London, 1903, must have appeared like magic to anyone looking on. But it wasn't. It was a hack. Thank you for listening. As always, you can find all of our past episodes on our website, malicious.life, and I'll be more than happy to hear your comments, thoughts, and ideas for future episodes at at ranlevi on Twitter, that's at R-A-N-L-E-V-I, and on ran at ranlevi.com. Our first annual listeners survey is live on the website, malicious.life, with a special bonus episode for those who take it. Also, if you'd like to be a sponsor of our show, you can reach out to us via the contact form in the website or via email at eliad at malicious.life. That's eliad, E-L-I-A-D, at malicious.life. 
Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. Thanks again to Cyber Reason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye. Daily Mail is zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x xdv.me. Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.pa0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 megahertzshop.nl. 70 mhzshop.nl.
Heb ik een volgende retour?